Okay, this is a very exciting episode of uh, my podcast for a couple of reasons. First of all, I've got Alex Gonzalez, uh, who's going to team up with me in an interview with the incredible Jay Bailey. So actually, I'll start, Alex, for those that aren't, uh, aren't in your massive network, mm-hmm. tell everybody who you are and what you do. Well, I'm Jay Bailey's friend, so that's, <laughs> that's how I describe my network, and it, it used to go from there. But yeah, obviously... Uh, Max Gonzalez and of course, you know, uh, Chief Innovation Austria Metro Atlanta Chamber is one uh, dimension, uh, which is where I get to work with great people like Jay Bailey um, in uh, growing our innovation ecosystem. And of course, uh, as, uh, as Jeff, you know, very well obsessed with innovation, transformation and how leaders do greatness. So um, host and produce Disruptor Studio where we've had Jay Bailey on, um, in addition to writing about all, all those topics um, after I've driven 20 years in corporate. So, um, so yeah, um, it's uh, pretty much a little bit of everything and I'll make something up if, it, if it'll fit the situation. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Jay Bailey, for those few that don't know, tell us who you are and what you do. Jeff, I mean, it's just good to be on with you and you and you and Alex, man. Jay Bailey, uh, president and CEO of the H.J. Russell Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, I, my job's simple. I'm wearing the shirt that says it, build black businesses. That's what we do. Uh, made by one of the bus businesses we support. Uh, but it's all about access and opportunity, um, building the largest center in America dedicated to growing, scaling, developing uh, Black businesses. Uh, access, opportunity, exposure is kind of my mantra these days. And I want to just bring the best resources in the world under one roof. Um, I think we all win when more of us are participating in the growth of our economy. And, and I want to make sure that my community has access to the best in the world. Awesome. And, and we'll get into how you how you got there. But what you guys are doing is truly, truly remarkable. Um, this this conversation is really meant to be a um, sort of a, a part two to the incredible interview that you two did on Disruptor Studio. Oh, yeah. Um, it was I mean, it, it really goes in depth into your story, Jay. And, it, and I listened to it again yesterday um, and was just as inspired as I was the first time. Um, mm-hmm. The things that you're doing um, today uh, to, to make change in the world is just, I mean, it's inspiring. That's the best way I can describe it. So uh, for those that didn't watch that episode, please go back. We'll put a link in the show notes. Um, but let's start with this, Jay. So, so um, I want to hit your story arc um, to get you to today. Um, and then dive into to more of your purpose. Um, mm-hmm. But you and, I, you and I both grew up here in, in the city, yeah? Correct. Yeah. Born in Atlanta, raised in Decatur, though. I got to give a shout out to the deck. Now, there is a difference. <laughs> there's Decatur, then there's the deck. There's a difference once you cross over Memorial Drive, but we'll talk about that another time. Well, no, wait, well, let, let me hear about that because I grew up here and I grew up in Stone Mountain, went to Stone Mountain High School. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know about the deck. Can you tell us about that real quick? Of course. Now, Stone Mountain, you guys didn't have any windows. That was like a prison, wasn't it? Man, it was. <laughs> yes. It is not the best. <laughs> but it, it is it is a tale of two cities. And I guess as we get into purpose, that may even come into it, Jeff. Mm-hmm. Um, that when you look at downtown Decatur and the walkable streets and the brunchy areas and the coffee shops and the storied houses, uh, it's just like in Atlanta and, and even in Decatur, there's that line of demarcation demarc- where once you cross over Memorial Drive, the scenery starts to change. Things go from colorful to gray. And it's all on the same street. It's all in the same city. Uh, but if you live on the south side of Memorial Drive in South DeKalb County, you know, downtown Decatur might as well be a million miles away. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was actually driving through home not too long ago, and it still bothers me that the tallest building in South DeKalb is the jail. Mm-hmm. Right there off uh, 285? Memorial. Yep. Yep. And uh, I mean, and that's a problem. And it's literally, as soon as you cross over Memorial Drive, there it is as a symbol, uh, the highest thing that you're gonna see in your community, uh, the largest structure uh, and what that message sends to young people as they pass it by, to adults as they pass it by. But you know what, I I owe a whole lot to Decatur. Um, A lot of my grit, determination, uh, courage uh, came from growing up in, in the deck uh, and I, you know, I will never, ever, ever, ever did, you know, <laughs> say anything less about it because it made me. And I absolutely love it and I try to return as much as I possibly can. Yeah, hey, Jay, you know, when, when you're not, when you and I uh, talked before and, and, and a great conversation, um, 
uh, you know, you really talked so much about how in your childhood, how much that shaped you, including entrepreneurism and, and, and going to the, you know, the barbershop and what you learned about what you learned about entrepreneurism, which is great. We'll get into this uh, later in terms of, you know, you've had so many dimensions in terms of where you could have gone and what you could have done. And so I think it's just great that what, with what you're doing with the Russell Center to help create entrepreneurs, but talk a little bit about how early in your life, that, that experience in terms of learning what even an entrepreneur is and how that shaped you? Oh, it's real. I mean, I didn't know what it was, but I had a natural hustle. Um, yeah. I used to sell I, popsicles in the ice tray. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I think I'd share it with you guys. I used to charge people 50 cents to fight in my backyard so they wouldn't get caught in the front yard. In fact, just last night, I was talking to a cousin of mine that used to be my biggest breadwinner because he wanted to fight everybody all the damn time. Uh, and it, it was just natural. It was an eight. Um, I was a latchkey kid, so we had to figure out a lot of stuff on our own. You come home, even in first, second grade, there's nobody in the house. You got to figure it out. And so, I mean, hell, that's the building block of an entrepreneur. See a problem, a fix a solution. Uh, the story I told you guys, it's real. I was riding my bike down Candler Road to the Candler Plaza Barbershop, Um get a haircut and when I was growing up you could have put a Bentley next to a Ferrari and I'd have taken a Mustang GT 5.0 every day of the week um this is my dream car literally I saw parked outside the barbershop a black on black convertible Mustang GT um lost my mind threw my bike down at a part of town you don't leave anything unlocked ran in the barbershop at 11 years old never forget it screamed out whose car is that um, the barber kind of gave me the universal brother symbol for that's me, kind of gave me the nod. Um, but immediately because of my, my, my consciousness in, in my community, I thought he was a drug dealer. Mm-hmm. Like who could afford that car here, but a drug dealer. Uh, and it was so normalized that there wasn't any judgment placed on him. Hop in his chair. I'm like, John, I know you were a dope boy. And he screamed at me, cursed at me, dropped a big F bomb on an 11 year old, told me to shut the F up. And uh, but he also told me to turn around and count how many chairs I saw in the shop. I was like, I don't know, 10. He says, well, each one of these barbers pays me $50 a week to cut hair at my shop. Do the math. Jay, you're smart. So as I started doing the math, he said, hold on. Don't, before you finish, bro, I got two more shops just like this. Finish the math. So when little Jay Bailey started adding up those zeros, comma, carry the one zero, he said it. He said, I'm an entrepreneur. What you need to do is go find you something that you love and go make money doing it. Nobody, I own this business. Nobody had ever given a name to what I thought I inherently was. Nobody had ever talked to me about ownership. So that bike ride home fundamentally changed my life. It literally where the tire shop, who owns it? Huge curiosity. Uh, Public library. Who owns public library? Who owns that piece of land? Who owns McDonald's? Mom, dad, do we own our house? We do. Self-esteem goes up, self-confidence goes up. Now I wanna fight you if you're crossing through our yard and I don't let you. It's literally the building blocks of where self-esteem, self-confidence, belief, belonging kind of resides when you understand who you are and this whole notion of ownership, like that pride and ownership that I lacked before. It's what led me to start my first business, the House of Boom, uh, where at 12, I started my first car audio installation business. And uh, from there, that story kind of, goes up and down from there but brother it's amazing how i wish i could find the barber um but just that whisper in my ear that he probably didn't even think twice about fundamentally changed the trajectory of a kid uh forever and so it's it's that how those little things can actually add up over a lifetime to really form a person I bet, Jay, he knew exactly what he was doing, just the way Mm. that you would know what you were doing today if you were in that similar situation and you were to Mm. start pointing, you know, I I bet he relished the chance to at least try to shape, you know, a young man down the right path. Because one of the things you talk about Mm. is um, uh, accessibility and um, proximity and the fact that, you know, if you grow up in Buckhead, you are very likely to have family members or friends or see entrepreneurs, CEOs, leaders. But if you grow up in Bankhead, very different things you're seeing. And, sure. You know, and so I bet he, I bet he knew what he was doing. Hey man, uh, I, I heard that he passed away. Um, don't know that for sure, but Jeff, you make a good point. 
I mean, because he's seen a, a thousand kids walk in that barbershop. He's seen a thousand kids make the wrong decisions. Uh, that's deep, Jeff. I don't, I don't know if I ever thought about it like that, that very intentionally he may, have, he may have been placed there. And quite honestly, culturally, the barbershop is, is, a, is an iconic kind of cultural representation of the black community. Mm -hmm. This is where the news is delivered. This is where the community is built. And Jeff, you're probably right, man. You're probably right. I, I never thought about it that way. Oh, and this thing, Jay, you, you talk about instilling purpose. And, and if I think mm. about what you do every day now, you know, I love how you talk about how you kind of whispered in your ear, this is what an entrepreneur, you know, this is what they do. This is what you do at scale now. Mm -hmm. And you took that moment and that barbershop and then with the Russell Center, you're doing this at scale to create the you know a whole another generation of entrepreneurs um, and not just because it's it, it's socially good because it's good business but but you you are somewhat of an entrepreneur whisperer right now there at, at uh, russell center right <laughs> brother full circle moment there man it's um i'm really excited about what we've lined up um uh, we've not been at this a long time yet just like an entrepreneur mm -hmm. we're in the startup phase um but for what we have planned um and the resources that have come come become available uh, I think we're going to be able to do it in a way that no one else has ever done before uh, at a level um, that maybe no one else had ever dreamed before uh, because we've got the right partners. And I, I talk about it often, but Atlanta, we've got to wake up and realize where we are. I mean, there's no other city that has the assets that we have right now to, to be a generator. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to call the Russell Center not an incubator or accelerator, but a generator. Yeah, but I, I feel the same way about Atlanta. Fortune 1000s, Fortune 500 innovation centers, colleges, universities, you got a Jeff, you got a you, I mean, like an active chamber. Of the, I mean, like we have all of the pieces and shame on us if we don't do enough of this community building together to make the whole world never forget that we were here and that we did something to make a difference. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to um, further your journey to get to Russell, but it does occur to me as we talk about this, that you, you walked out of that barbershop and you started to understand that um, the hustle um, that, that you already had inside of you could be put to an entrepreneurial lens that you could start something. But I also realized, uh, I would expect that you're, you had other options other than, you know, legit businesses, which is mm -hmm. what you started. So, so was there, what do you think what it was that, that stopped you from taking the easy quick cash path to starting, you know, illegal businesses or getting involved in things you shouldn't have instead of going down a path of actually building things that, you know, were on the up and up. Well, and I had a mother that would literally fight me close fist <laughs> <laughs> done, done different things. But I think that the one difference, um, is that there, there was a certain code when I grew up and there was a certain protection of kids. Um, the cousin that I talked about yesterday was one of my role models, yes, and he made some decisions. Uh, but one of the better ones that he did is he would always say, Jay, this isn't for you. Um, you have an opportunity, get an education, go do great things. You got your mom and your dad in the home. You got stuff we'll never have. And there was a, a whole group of my, my peers and my friends and my community and my hood that just would not allow me mm -hmm. to make those decisions. And I don't think we bring up that narrative a lot because there are a lot of Jay Bailey's out there uh, where those that made bad decisions understood their life circumstances that forced them to make those bad decisions. But there was a time where those understood their decisions and made damn sure that folks that had more opportunity went that way. Yeah. And I literally, Jeff, was pushed by even those making the worst decisions to say, if I ever see you doing this, or if you ever make a decision like this, and that, that goes a long way. And it's kind of a, even a tearful uh, reconciliation, revi re like revelation in my head about those that literally force me to do good. They, you know, you don't have the right to fail. Uh, my father-in-law shared that with me a little while ago, what his father short shared with him. You don't have a right to fail. Like there's so much being put into you, so much invested in you. No, go that way. You know, Jay, it's, it's kind of interesting because we, as we talk here and you talk about, because I think uh, Jeff's question is good. I think there's another angle in terms of also the choice of, you also could have had a choice of going on and 
becoming and this, you know, creating the next uh, Airbnb or whatever it is, right? I mean, you know, you, had you on Disruptive Studio because you have that X factor. I'm convinced whatever you do, you will be successful. <laughs> I, mean, I truly believe that. And, um, but uh, you, you've had some moments in your life, which I think were key to, uh, you know, contributing to who you are, hmm. um, including at one point, uh, you, you know, having incredible success, you know, in real estate, uh, you know, having a home at a, in a country club, and then you, you, you were homeless mm -hmm. for, for a period of time. And, and you pulled yourself out of that and built. And now, so here's the thing. I think you could have chosen to, to become this just, quote unquote, traditional entrepreneur and tech entrepreneur and scale, but you really committed your life on around, around purpose. Mm. So talk a little bit about that decision. Cause you've, 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 you know, you've had the, the, the Mercedes or whatever, and you've, you could have <laughs> created a life and not, not saying that now, look, I know, I, I know, yeah, you I, I know, I know where you spend your weekend. So, so I know yeah, that no. you, you definitely celebrate success, but you, you have committed yourself to helping others. What was that? what contributed to making that decision on being so purposeful? You know, it, it was a, another revelation that occurred s several years ago, but it became really clear to me. Um, my mother was a philanthropist, hmm. never made more than $38,000 a year, but she was a true philanthropist. Um, I shared in my story, probably Alex, when we talked that there was a moment in homelessness where everything just kind of clicked. Uh, I was thumbing through a photo album. Uh, here I am, in a, and to paint the scene for those that didn't see the other podcast, like I'm literally living in a nine by nine storage unit, plugging power to the main building, running it into the storage unit. Um, got a pull string light bulb. I'm thumbing through a photo album, and I see all these pictures of random kids. They're not my cousins. They're not my friends, but they're at my grandmother's house. They're at Thanksgiving. They're at Christmas. Like, who the hell are these kids? Like, who are they? And it, I remember when my mother, my mother passed away in 96. So again, guys, the, the context of this is from zero to 1819, you know, I had this rock solid support system. And then from 19 on, that was completely gone. Hmm. So now as I'm thinking about these memories, and that even ties into Alex's stories about the money and that becoming the crutch. And there was a lot of depression going on. However, thumb through his photo, I'm like, who are these kids? And it clicked. My mom, when she was living, she was a juvenile justice worker. And Jeff, this will go into talking about where that purpose comes from. She knew then, like I, I live by now, you take a kid in a bad environment, no role models, no exposure, compounded hopelessness for 10 or 15 years. Why are you surprised he got a gun to your head? How could he possibly value your life if he barely values his? Uh, sometimes crime ain't about, it's, sometimes it's about dignity. The, the one time in my life, Jeff, when I see you pull up in your nice car, in your nice suit, every day of my life registers that you're better than me on a higher art. When I pull out this gun and make you get down, for that one second in life, yeah, it may be about the nice things that you have, but there's this inherent need that we all have to be in control and to have some type of power over our lives. And maybe I, I demonstrate that by my power and strength and brood over you. My mom, bless her, used to probably break the law and snatch these kids out of halfway houses and lock up and bring them to Christmas dinner, put them around family, show them what love looked like, passing green beans or talking about each other or hugging on each other. I remember my mom used to make me every year make my Christmas list in August. So we didn't have a ton of money but she would save up her money to buy a kid something they would really want, not the throwaway gifts. Because guys, if you want to be depressed, go to the malls at Christmas time and look in the Toys for Tots buckets and see what more affluent people throw in those buckets as charity for less, less fortunate kids. So every year she would go, hey, Jeff, baby, go grab that box under the tree. And Jeff will go grab that box in the tree. And as soon as you look down, Big letters on purpose, big letters. It'd say Jeff. And Jeff would tear into that box and it wouldn't be like a charity gift. It'd be like the gift that all the kids wanted. And instantly that kid would feel seen. They'd feel loved. they feel like feel like they belong. And I used to see this every single year. And it's funny, even to this day, when I make Facebook posts about her or, you know, uh, Instagram, almost twice, three times a year. 
I get some random person sending me a DM saying, was your mom Millie Bailey? And it's, you know, to see it like 25 years later, how much of an impact she had on on their life. So Jeff, when you talk about purpose, my real thing going from having a lot of money, uh, spending 10 grand in a club at night, I could not reconcile that I could spend 10 grand in a nightclub in one night, but there was no scholarship in my mother's name. Mm. Um, By the world standards, I had been successful, the cars, the houses, the clothes, but I had zero significance. Mm. Like I had some deep, deep tears, deep grief, but deep reconciliation for where I was around purpose. And literally the thing, when I talk about exposure guys, because you talked about the bankhead and buckhead thing, I could not deny that my whole life, I have been exposed to what it meant to, to be, live a life beyond yourself, to live a life of significance, to literally take the resources that you've been blessed with and maximize them for the benefit of others, not yourself. Um, and this was my role model. But I think the pain of her death really caused me to kind of separate those memories and say, you know what, they're too tough to think about. Those good times hurt too much. But when they came rushing back, there was no denying that literally everything that I had been taught was about how you can serve other people. Mm -hmm. So from that moment, there was a switch. I mean, from that moment, everything that I had done from then on was all Mm -hmm. about other people. It was all about paying my rent. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I think that uh, Greg Ellison, he's a a professor over at Emory Divinity School. Mm -hmm. Um, He has this incredible story about asking his aunt she was sitting on the porch, snapping some green beans, a good Southern aunt. And he asked her, auntie, how can I change the world? And she said, baby, I, I don't know how you change the world, but I do know how to affect the three feet around you. How can you change the three feet around you? And I took that to heart. And it, it doesn't have to be in big swatches because I don't necessarily believe that there's a program that can end poverty or there's a program that can make everything equal. I think it's incremental. You know, Mr. Russell became a plasterer because his dad was a plasterer. Doctors become doctors because their uncle, their cousin, their best friend's dad or something. It's about proximity. And while we think about the macro all the time with sweeping change, we we forget the, the micro. And when you start relating it to business, it's people like Jeff Hillmeyer that actually make our economy run not just the Googles and the Amazons. How many employees do you have, Jeff? About 30. Those companies are the backbone of America's economy. We tend to focus way up here and not on the Jeff Hillmeyers of the world that actually make this thing work. And I think change and purpose uh, and transformative change in community is the very same way that it won't come from the big government program. It won't come from the big sweeping, you know, 10,000 person nonprofit. It's going to happen when my wife and I just decide to walk over to the high school next door to our our home and say, hey, kids, I'm Jay, I'm Blaine, you know, let's talk. Uh That's where it happens. And I I don't ever want to lose that. And I think, Jeff, when you talk about purpose, I saw that happen constantly, that it was about one person who wasn't the the boss of DHR or defects or, or the juvenile justice system. She was just kind of a cog in the wheel, but literally affected her three feet everywhere she went. And, and that's really the base of, you know, when I talk about I don't have the right to fail, I saw an example of someone that did so much more with so much less. And I've been blessed in many ways. My family's been blessed in many ways. Uh, so when you talk about scale, I got a Millie Bailey at scale. Yeah. And that's, kind of, that's, that's the mantra for me. Well, if, 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 uh, again, if people haven't heard the interview you did with Alex on Disruptor, um, I, I want them to go back and listen to the part. We'll, we'll put a link uh, directly to this part of the interview where you talk about uh, the difference of success and significance. Mm. And I think that's what you were talking about there. Um, and, and so what I want to do is ask you this sort of final um, question. Uh, you know, it occurs to me that whatever you do going forward, um, businesses that you build, run, contribute to, um, they have to have significance. 
that it's not enough for you to just build a business that is successful, that has, you know, high growth and margin, um, but it has to have significance. And so my question is, is it too much to ask for the, the people that you're helping um, through the Russell Center, um, that you're helping them to create businesses and, and, and maybe um, found businesses to, to also um, inspire them a little bit the way that your mom inspired you or the people mm-hmm. around you inspired you, right? So you can wear your barber hat, which is you can build your own business, but you can also wear your mom's hat and say, and that business can be a positive contributor in some way, shape, or form, or at least you can as a citizen, as a leader, and maybe they need to emanate more of that, you know, proximity. And, and so is that a part of the mission? Can it be, or is that too much to ask of people to, to do both of those things at the same time? Without any hesitation, I have failed at my job if that's not the culture that we create. Awesome. Um, you know, I am rooting the Russell Center, you know, most incubators, accelerators, entrepreneur programs really focus on the informative. How can I get the right information to companies? My perspective is we got to focus on the transformative. And if it's not rooted in culture, community, and covenant, you wrap that around a world-class curriculum, you wrap that around world-class instructors, but at the heart of it is community, culture, and covenant. That's what moves people's hearts. That's what keeps a business in business for 20 years, not just a book of information. If we get this right, and Jeff, let me take that back, when we get this right, it'll be about the covenant. What is my responsibility to this thing that I wanna birth, this business that I wanna create? What's my commitment to the community that we're creating within our CIE? But also what's our obligation collectively to the community that exists outside of these walls? Mm -hmm. And that's gotta be preached every single day to a point where it becomes culture and you feel like an outlier an outsider and and just a the worst person if you're not looking at building your business that way um yeah brother if if i don't do that nothing else matters i can show you 10 businesses that have 100x 200x 300x growth yeah but if i don't see that translate into transformative shift giving back this circular economy, if you will, with no waste when it comes to entrepreneurs and community when they meet, then yeah, Jay, quit. Quit your job and go do something else because you've not done your job. Yeah, and it it occurs to me that, you know, if you can create, you know, a hundred Jay Baileys, which which I say that to mean um, leaders, um, entrepreneurs who are trying to use their gifts to make the world a better place, um, that's the real, that, that's how you take your three feet and multiply it. Right. And that's how you send out. And then they're going to affect the next and the next. And to me, that's really powerful about what you're doing. So, so Jay, what, what can people do who are listening to this, who are inspired by what you're talking about? Is there anything people could do? Where would you point them to get involved, to help out and to be a part of the movement? 2021 is going to be a hell of a year, Jeff. Um, new curriculum, new website, even a new name. I'll come back and tell you about that, how everything is changing. Uh, So for right now, RCIE.org, Russell Center on all the social media platforms, uh, we're building something really special on the West side. And, uh, you know, we will really be able to get into our groove this year and really show the world what we're capable of. Um, LinkedIn, it's kind of like my quasi back office. So follow me there, Jay Bailey, J-A-Y-B, I guess it's right there. Hit me at Jay Bailey. Uh, and, and let's connect, man, because I just think that, you know, I, I say it all the time and it's, it's the African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, and I am always a fan of going farther together. So for folks like Jeff and, and Alex, thank you for always believing in what we're doing and supporting. Uh, but I think we got a good shot at making history uh, with folks like this on this this podcast and others that we know. Uh, man, let's go do it. Like, why not? That's my big mantra. WTFN. Why the F not? Mm-hmm. Let's go get it. Let's go do it. Uh, there's there are people whose their whole lives are dependent upon us going as far as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. They'll send their kid to college because Jeff had the guts to go make it happen. They'll they'll buy their first home, Alex, because you helped a company come to Atlanta and grow. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll put their grandmother in her, in her dream car because, you know, we helped them build a business. 
uh, that allowed them to do that. There's just so much at stake. And so let's go with some courage into 2021 and make some things happen. And Jay, we've known, we've known each other now, I guess, I guess under a couple of years now or a little year and a half, whatever it is. And if um, I tell you, if you, if, if people could see how far Jay has taken uh, this Russell center in, in, in a very short period of time, it, it's pretty amazing. When you have, when you have big checks being written from <laughs> some pretty, pretty amazing people from around the country, Sure. Um, it, it, that's, you know, you know, it's not even about the check size. It's about the, the trust they have and how important this is. And so Jay, one, congratulations to you. Cause, um, cause what you're doing is amazing. And it's, it's, it's a much more than an incubator and accelerator. I love what you say. It's a generator. It's something unique. And I believe if people follow, I would suggest everybody follow this, the story of Russell center and what Jay is doing, because it is uh, definitely of uh, national if not global significance. Um, and we're right here at the foundation forming aspect of it too. So it's pretty mm-hmm. amazing. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alex. Um, man, you guys are just awesome. Thank you. Well, good luck, man. We'll be, we'll be supporters. So My brother. We'll, we'll be excited to have you back. Thanks, Jay. Oh man. Take care guys.